The discovery that it is possible to create quantum dots using solution chemistry was made by Professor Louis Bruce, who was born in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, received his PhD in 1969 from Columbia University, where he is now a professor. Uh, please welcome on stage for his Nobel lecture, Professor Louis Bruce. Okay. Well, I want to thank the Nobel Foundation for the great, great honor of this uh, prize and allowing me to talk this morning. Um, a few mistakes creep into the slides, wrong date and so forth. I got to go back. Okay. Um, okay. So I'd like to talk about chemical quantum dots and our effort to make, um, <clears throat> to, cre to create these things in solution and that will typically in be involving cadmium, cadmium selenide. I'm pushing the wrong button here. Cad oops, backwards one more time. Yeah, cadmium selenide. Uh, two, two six semiconductor. The uh, red balls are selenium atoms. The small ones, blue ones, are cadmium cadmium atoms or ions. It's a tetrahedral material. Each each um, blue ball is surrounded by four red ones, and each red one surrounded by four blue ones. And uh, I'll use, uh, also talk some about short uh, carbon nanotubes as in order to contrast their behavior to the uh, nanocrystals. So here's a slide showing nature's, on the left hand side, biological nanoscience. Uh, starting with macroscopic objects coming down in size all the way to uh, proteins. And proteins are about the same size as nanocrystals here or carbon nanotubes. This might be 35 angstroms in diameter. This one might be uh, 10 angstroms in diameter. This is carbon 60 or buckleball, buckyball. It was awarded the Nobel Prize some years ago, Rick Smalley and his, and his collaborators. You can see the DNA over here, maybe 10 angstroms, 20 angstroms in diameter, roughly the same as a larger carbon nanotube. So the quantum dots, the colloidal quantum dots, began when I was a staff scientist in AT&T Bell Labs 
in the late 1982 first observations. Um, this Bell Laboratories was the uh, research and development laboratory of the telephone monopoly in the United States. And they were mainly concerned with uh, the science, science that would support things that were critical in communications. New materials, uh, mathematics of, trans of, of, phone, of the phone, of phone system, and computer chips. And I want to thank the leadership of Bell Labs for supporting this research in its earliest stages, uh, long before it was recognized as important by the academic community in the United States. So let's begin with what is a semiconductor nanocrystal? As Alexei was describing, it's a small piece of rock. In this case, it might be 30 angstroms in diameter, maybe 10 atoms across from one side to the other. And if, uh, down here, you can see that it, maybe there are 40% of the atoms are actually on the surface. Um, made by chemical synthesis, I don't need to describe this right now, but creating a colloid that has this 30 angstrom diameter particle with ligands on the surface, ligands to give stability and functionality, as you'll, as you'll see in, in a minute. I'd like to convince you this really is a branch of chemistry. And so I show you uh, the apparatus, you know, for making quantum dots of a certain size. This is a photograph taken in my laboratory. A three-necked flask. Thermocouple coming in one side, maybe 15 or 20 cc's of solvent on the bottom, a stirring bar, and a septum for injection of chemicals, heating mantle to heat up the, heat up the solvent. Um, so in this situation, we can adjust the temperature and we can initiate the reaction either by injection through the septum here or by having one of, one of the reagents already dissolved in the liquid on the bottom. This p offers the opportunity to control the composition as a function of size. You know, so you can begin to grow one nanocrystal, one type of nanocrystal in the bottom, and then halfway through the growth, you can inject reagents to grow another nanocrystal through the septum and get core shell nanocrystals. It's, all right. Here's an example of what you can make with time. Cartoon. We start with the reagents to make cadmium selenide in the center. Nucleation and growth, you stop at this size. And then you start injecting reagents to make cadmium sulfide. If the conditions are correct, you will not nucleate any new cadmium sul sulfide, but it will grow on the surface of the pre-existing cadmium selenide. And then you can continue by injecting at the final stage uh, zinc sulfide reagents, car carboxylic acid capping on the surface at the end of the reaction. This is useful because it keeps, you know, it's basically a piece of semiconductor surrounded by material with larger band gaps. Zinc sulfide is almost an insulator like that. So now let me talk in detail about how to, how to go through this and what we did. And for, for the young students in the audience, let me say this is, in fact, the way we gave talks in the 1980s. Before the, before the invention of PowerPoint, you, you see my handwriting, on, uh, handwriting cartoon effort to make sense of it all. Initially, we worked just in solution. My first experiments were done in aqueous precipitation, in aqueous solution, and uh, sometimes in alcohols, and sometimes at low temperature. And a problem with that is that particles, you'll have two particles that are growing, and they'll diffuse and touch each other, and they're reactive on their surfaces, so they'll fuse together to make a dumbbell-shaped particle. And pretty soon you have an aggregation 
You don't want that. You want to grow individual particles. So the first effort we made was to use inverse micelle solutions. This is like 1986, when Paul Alvasados first came to be a postdoc. Uh, inverse micelle solution, maybe 99% heptane and 1% water with some soap. And, and it's, there's a spontaneous phase separation into these little water droplets, 50, 100 angstroms across in the heptane solution. Then the idea was to dissolve cadmium ions in the water, maybe five or 10, maybe just one. And this will be a tiny reagent ve vesicle that would allow you to grow one particle inside the micelle and it would be protected against aggregation by the others by the soap structure. And so the second reagent, so we're going to precipitate cadmium selenide, cadmium's dissolved in the water, bring in an organometallic reagent, uh, trimethylsilyl selenide, that will hydrolyze and grow to make a small particle. So that works. And you could, as Alexei was describing, you can follow this process by the change in the optical spectrum because the color is proportional to diameter. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You could make a solution like this. And then we figured out that you could control the growth. You know, so you could stop adding reagents. Uh, cadmium all used up. Uh, everything precipitated, let it sit for an hour, and then re add more reagents. And what you would find is if you added the reagents slowly, the pre-existing small particles would grow to be larger, but you would not nucleate any new, any new particles. So we had a system by which we could um, grow various sizes. You know, you start with this, and take the spectrum, make it a little, you know, add reagents, particles would grow larger. You could tell it was growing larger by the change in the optical absorption and the change in the fluorescence. And then we thought a little bit more about what to do with the surface. The surface of the one particle remains very reactive. Okay. When Munji came as a postdoc, after Paul went to uh, Berkeley as assistant professor, uh, we figured out, and it was mainly Mike Steigerwald who was the driving force behind this, that we could change the nature of the surface of the particle. If you have, um, you have this growth process to make a particle, and then in the last stage, you, you uh, eject phenyl trimethylsilyl selenide. And that will react on the surface of the particle and put phenyl radicals on the surface of the particle. And in fact, that changes the particles from hydrophobic to hydro, um, hydro, hydrophilic to hydrophobic. Um, so while, while the particles, when, they're hydro, when they dissolve in the water, they stay in micellar solution. But as soon as you change the surface like this, put phenyl radicals on the surface, they uh, come out of the water and go into the heptane, and they're not very soluble in the heptane either. And so they fall to the bottom of the beaker, and you have pale yellow powder on the bottom of this solution. And then, so that means you can extract it, the particles out of the micellar solution, and you have a pure sample, dry sample of this material. And then we thought about this a little bit more. And in principle, the surface is, is bound, you know, the, the selenium atoms on the surface are bound to phenyl radicals. The cadmium atoms on the surfaces are bare in principle. We wanted to do something with the surface to passivate them even more. So the thought was to dissolve them in Lewis-based solvent. And the lone pairs on the solvent would in fact uh, coordinate, made a dative chemical bond to the cadmium atoms on the surface. So we did that and uh, first experiment actually was in pyridine, and then refluxing in pyridine, 
And we realized that the particles were getting better when we refluxed them above room temperature. See, the weakness that we didn't understand in the beginning was all of this prior work was done at room temperature, but the growth is better at higher temperature. Here's an experiment where we re refluxed in tributylphosphine, tributylphosphine oxide at 230 centigrade for three hours. And it made larger particles, beautiful red solution uh, of uh, wurtzite structure. This was making zinc blend, this is making wurtzite. You don't need to understand the difference with, between these two structures. Anyway, there was a route found to better materials by working in Lewis space solvents at higher temperature. But this was not understood. This what was actually going on here. It's a recipe, f you know, for making larger particles, but it was, didn't work all the time. It was intermittent. And uh, it was obviously being controlled by some impurities, something we didn't have under control. Um, wasn't ready to publish by any means, but it was an exi existence proof that you could. You know, there was, nature had found some way to make better particles. This is the problem that Munji took to MIT when he went to be um, assistant professor, and you'll hear about all of this shortly. Bell Labs is a very collaborative institution, and you see we're able to do lots of characterization of these, of these materials, this one and that one as well. So this synthesis, chemical synthesis in solution, can, can work spectacularly well when it's optimized. Many people over the last 30 or 40 years have contributed to this improvement in the processing of the particles and invention of new routes to make different materials. And you see here some data from the laboratory of Chris Murray, who at that time was at IBM and who's in the audience today. This is making lead selenide nanocrystals. And you can see that um, perfect little cubes, each one's a single nanocrystal. Uh, you see in this higher resolution image the lattice planes of the individual atoms. So again, this is just an evidence that you can make really good stuff if you optimize the synthesis. Synthesis is the critical part of all of this. And um, OK. So how was it that we could do this in Bell Labs uh, with enthusiasm? So Bell Labs was concerned with the future of, of computing and the future of microelectronics. And the main thing that was going on at that time, 1985, um, was the uh, miniaturization of transistors, not made by chemical means, but by photolithography. And this shows an old slide, um, 45 nanometer size, 2000, year 2007, transistor on a chip like that coming smaller and smaller and smaller on down. So the thing which, grow, which, uh, the thing which drove the industry was um, made computers better and cheaper, more powerful was this miniaturization. And so we were in, we were coming, and so, but what, that would have to change when you, silicon has certain properties as a bulk material, when you get it small enough, as Alexei has, has been describing, its physical properties, the mobility of the electron, the optical properties would change, and the transistor design would have to change accordingly to, accompany, to, take, to reflect the fact that the properties of the very small particles were different than the properties of the bulk material. So in our minds, we were doing long-range basic research. Research of relevance to the future of the industry Relevance maybe in 10 years, 20 years out, who knows? And I looked up in preparation for this talk the, the current status of these computer chips. And everyone has a cell phone. And uh, pulled this thing out, and in here is a, a chip designed by Apple, the M1 chip. This 
chip has, it's hard to believe, but the truth is it has 110 billion transistors on one chip in an organized fashion to do computation. Can you imagine, you know, this, after all this work by so many people over the decades, 110 billion transistors on one chip. So this now has pushed down into the regime that we were thinking about in the 1980s. You know, the truth is that this uh, transistor business is one of the great achievements of mankind, in my mind, you know. This uh, has improvement in communications, imp the improvement in computers has com completely changed the modern world, you know, compared with 50 years ago. A change as dramatic as the uh, improvement of DNA technology and for medicine and for clinical work. So we got into this accidentally, as many things happen in research. It wasn't our intention to look for quantum size effects in the beginning. I was doing experiments on the surface photochemistry of uh, semiconductor colloids. Colloidal particle can absorb one photon create an excited state, which is an electron hole pair. And uh, if you have an organic molecule on the surface, you can get oxidation or reduction reactions. Um, that experiment is best done in a colloid because the surface area is so high between the solvent and the surface of the solid material. So we had these old recipes, old recipes for, for making uh, colloids, and occasionally, uh, occasionally I would, uh, um, I gotta get back to the right place here. Let's, occasionally we'd make a colloid, and the band gap was a little bit larger than the bulk band gap, and I didn't know why. And you can see that here. Um, this is the absorbance, optical absorption spectrum of uh, cadmium sulfide in a bulk material, basically, it begins at 5,000 angstroms, you know, and absorbs light to the, to the blue of 5,000. You'd make a small particle solution, the absorption ends would shift, and uh, the, a little bump would appear, and the bump was, in fact, the beginning of an exciton. So this was evidence that we had, we had just as Alexei was describing, we had come into the, uh, we were by accident now getting small enough that we were intermediate or hybrid between molecular properties and solid state properties. We were in this intermediate regime. And so let's think a little bit about why and how that might be the case. Um, Alexei showed the um, equations for the quantum size effect which come from the band structure of the solid, okay? I'd like to show an equivalent way of understanding that that's quantum size effect using the language of chemistry. And the key thing is that in a large crystal, a large silicon crystal, you have tetrahedral coordination, sp3 hybridization, silicon surrounded by four others in the, in the bulk. That's the same as in a small molecule. Here's a disilane molecule. SP3 hybridization, sigma-sigma bond between two silicons, and then capping on the surface by hydrogen atoms. Local chemical bonding around each silicon atom is the same in the molecule and the crystal. That's the key. And so here's the way to understand how this connects with the solid state. Uh, this little red dot is one silicon atom and what energy is plotted on this scale, and across here is the size of the nanocrystal, of the number of silicon atoms in a nanocrystal. If you have the two silicon atoms, uh, disilane, sigma bond formed between one silicon atom and the next, like that, bonding orbital with two electrons in it, and the antibonding orbital with no electrons in it. This is what we teach in freshman chemistry. 
All right, and so this splitting sigma to sigma star is the strength, basically a measure of the strength of the chemical bonding of the crystal. For a diamond crystal, this splitting is really, really large. Um, bonding is very strong. It, this, the splitting is different for every semiconductor. Now, suppose we get to the situation we have a really small um, silicon cluster that has maybe 10 or 15 of these bonds in it, like with capping on the surface. So you, you have, in fact, 10 sigma orbitals, 10, 10, anti -sig, 10 sigma star orbitals. So these couple together, and they, they, to make a, a, sh a narrow band of molecular orbitals like this, spreading out with the center of gravity with the original sigma orbital, many, many more states here, and uh, a width developing as a function of size. Mathematics of this width is known, you, you know, and that mathematics is, is, equi is equivalent to the, to the band structure equations that Alexei showed. So in molecular language, this is a molecule, big molecule. It's a homo and a lumo, and uh, optical transition from here to here. So as it grows larger, this, you have more and more states down here. They get closer and closer together. Eventually, they overlap with respect to their natural widths, and you form a band of occupied orbitals, which in the solid state language is the valence band. And there's a band up here of empty orbitals, the conduction band. And so you can see that the, in the asymptotic limit of a larger crystal, there's a band gap that controls the absorption. For, to, to the blue of this band gap, you know, it's absorbing at every wavelength and it's transparent to the red of this gap. Uh, this is the HOMO and the LUMO of the bulk crystal. This is the HOMO and the LUMO of the, of the nanocrystal. You can see just by this, the way the problem is set up symmetrically, this HOMO-LUMO transition is larger in the, in, in the crystal, this, the chemical quantum dot, than it is in the bulk material. So this energy difference between here and here is in fact the quantum size effect. And it means that the stability on a per atom basis in the, in, in the cluster is uh, less than in the bulk material. The prediction is that in, in, in a quantum dot, you have discrete molecular orbitals, although very close together. And so if the resolution is good enough, you can see these various transitions close to each other. So the continuous spectrum of the bulk material breaks up into a number of close, closely lying optical transitions. Looks like a molecule, like an aromatic hydrocarbon. You know, an aromatic hydrocarbon in solution might have a number of excited states um, that, you can, that, you can that you can resolve. Semiconductors luminous. And, uh, you know, when they're made well, when they're, when they're crystalline and you control the number of defects in them, they luminesce really well. The optical signals that are carried in optical fibers are made by little semiconductor lasers. Um, Christmas tree lights are now made by uh, light emitting diodes of semiconductors. The laser pointer in here is uh, se semiconductor based. And it's true as well that the quantum dots will emit light very well if they're well made, crystalline, and the surface, is, the chemical valence on the surface is, is, take, is um, uh, corrected. All right, here we go. There's another thing going on. As I, uh, it's a shame I don't have a good picture of that. You have a quantum dot like this. It has an electron and a hole in it. And the um, electric field lines begin on the hole and they terminate on the electron and they pass through the semiconductor mostly. But some of the electric field lines fringe out and then come back into the nanocrystal to terminate on the opposite charge. It's, and so that means the Coulomb attraction 
uh, depends on the, optic, on the dielectric constant of the solvent as well as the dielectric constant of the semiconductor. And so this is an attraction, uh, and it's a little bit stronger. Let me go to the next slide. If, if we drop back into the solid state language, this is the quantum size effect due to this incomplete band structure. Uh, and this is the Coulomb attraction between the electron and the hole. And so the, the, ho the, the homo to lumo transition occurs at this energy, uh, asymptotically coming into the bulk band gap, but shifting blue as a function of smaller diameter. It's a very simple model. It's approximately correct, but it, it has the virtue that there are no adjustable parameters in this. It's um, based entirely on things which you can measure in the bulk, and then in zero order, you can use it to predict what the band gap will be of a particle of a certain size of that material. Effective masses and the dielectric constant are different for each material. Okay. So putting this all together, putting this all together, uh, we can recognize uh, spectroscopic regimes for uh, quantum dot as it grows larger. If you have just maybe 10 atoms, it is a molecule in all respects, and the chemical bonding is different than in the bulk, has no relation to the bulk. But as it gets larger, the chemical bonding and the structure will shift into being an excised little fragment of the bulk, especially if you terminate the surface. And so in this size regime, you get these quantum dots that we're making through solution chemistry. You get to even larger. When you get to the diameter equal to the wavelength of light, then there's further changes in the spectra due to electromagnetic effects. There are also kinetic size regimes that I don't have time to talk about. And I just have one minute, so let me just give you, I'll give you uh, what else is going on in, in nanoscience with respect to the electrons. So uh, what are the electrons doing? Um, when you think about this inner side, intermediate size regime, there are a number of things which happen which are not characteristic either of molecules or the bulk material. One is this uh, quantum size effect that I've been talking about. That's a single electron property quantum, shown by quantum dots. There's strong electron correlation. Um, this is single electron property. This is a multi-electron property. For example, if you have electrons want to avoid colliding with each other, they all have the same charge. So in a bulk material, if one electron is coming like this and the other electron is coming like this, they're heading towards each other, one can turn up and the other can turn down and avoid each other. So that, that this process of avoiding each other is a very strong function of dim dimensionality of the material. It's much harder to avoid the collision in two dimensions and especially hard in one dimension. And this can be shown uh, in uh, excitons and carbon, well, in, yeah, let me go back and get it to the right place. In a carbon nanotube, short, you know, you can make an excited state, electro absorb a photon, make an excited state. Carbon nanotubes fundamentally different than a nanocrystal because it has one dimension which is, which is still long, like this. So an electron in the carbon nanotube, if the electron is going around the circumference, it comes back on itself and it has to show positive interference to make a stationary state. And uh, that's the same thing as in a nanocrystal. You can think of it in a nanocrystal, electron is going, uh, bounces off the wall, comes back into the interior of the nanocrystal, has to interfere with itself constructively rather than destructively. This is a little bit like Bohr's original model for the hydrogen atom. Bohr's model was that electrons are going around in orbits and there has to be an integral number of wavelengths, the Rosley wavelengths going around and um, to make a stationary state. So 1s, 2s, 1p, 2p, all these were stationary states in Bohr's model. Well, all right, so since the time is up, let me just go ahead and try to bring this to a conclusion. 
there's strong screening as well. If you think about, you know, a carbon nanotube has electrons right on the surface, and so the, the field, if you create an electron hole pair, the electric field will come out, pushing the wrong button, electric field will come out and partially go into the solvent and then come back again to the opposite charge in the nanotube. So that's, this is, um, it senses the properties of a solvent. The excited state senses the properties of a solvent. That's basically a molecular property. A bulk solid state material, um, everything happens inside. The surface is not relevant for a big crystal. This is behaving more like a molecule. All right, I'll we'll skip this one and skip this comparison. Conclusion, in, carbon, in, in nanocrystals, the size dependence of the electrical and operator properties result from simple quantum confinement uh, with relatively little electron correlation. Nanocrystals are in fact excellent classes of large molecules and excellent chromophores if in fact you can make them well and the structure is annealed. Carbon nanotubes are superb wires. In nanoscience, you can see from what I've said and what Alexei has said that synthesis is a critical technology. You can theorize all day long about this, but what you actually, what is important is to make them and actually study what properties they have rather than just think about it abstractly. All right. So I'm profoundly grateful to the Nobel Foundation for this honor, as I said. Also profoundly grateful to my family for support over the decades, to my wife, Marilyn, three children, and now four grandchildren, all of whom are here in the meeting today. The essence of making progress in, originally in Bell Labs was through collaboration. Tim Harris, Mike Steigerwald, Bill Wilson, Munji, Paul, Jay Troutman, Sasha Efros, for um, all these different aspects of putting the problem together. You can see this problem is partly theory, partly organic chemistry, organometallic chemistry, uh, material science. You need expertise in all these areas. Um, going back to what I said about Bell Labs, you know, I'm lucky to have been there when this project started because it was the kind of institution that could support this strong collaboration and which understood the importance of this on the 10 or 20 year scale. There was no work of this sort in American universities at that time. Nobody was thinking about this problem. If I had gone to the NSF and asked them for money, um, it wouldn't have worked, you know, nobody else would think this was important. All right. Last slide. I think I was in Hong Kong maybe 10 years ago and had to overnight to, um, put together to give some thoughts to a, a room full of high school students about this size, about what they should be thinking about in doing research. And so this is what I came up, up with. We're all trapped by our educational backgrounds. You come out of school knowing a certain field. You don't know anything about other fields of science. Um, that limits what you can do, for sure. And the way, to, the way to combat this is every day learn something new. I tell my grad students that the greatest skill they have is to continue to learn by themselves after they have left graduate school. Most of the things that I've used in my life were invented after I left graduate school. And I had to keep learning just to keep up with the field. Why are your what, is your, what are your colleagues working on and why the, do they think it's important? Search continuously for a better problem than the one you're working on at present. Choice of the problem is the most important scientific decision you will ever make. You know, so if you're a competent scientist and someone gives you a well-defined problem, you probably can work it out. 
The hard thing is to figure out what to do in the beginning if someone doesn't give you the problem. That means to recognize where there's opportunity that other people don't see yet. You know. Problems that are difficult in one field can be easy in other fields. And the last thing is certainly true. You don't have to be a genius to make good progress. You have to be dedicated, be intelligent, and have discipline to keep working, but not be a true genius. So I've tried to tell you a little bit of this, and we only got through part of it. And I thank you for your attention today. <laughs>